Son of I, Another Way of Seeing, with Dr. Stephen P. Heiler. I've been very fortunate to spend most of my life in India, or in and working about and around India. Um, doesn't mean that I've been there 24-7. I'm there generally uh, for the, an average of four months a year now. Uh, but it has been um, 47 years been working in India. Uh, and my field is the documentation of the, the arts of India. What I started doing was just the arts of India that weren't being documented were not being noticed. And it largely was rural arts to begin with, or urban arts that were less known, but not the classical arts per se. But since I have a PhD, and my PhD is actually in the art and archaeology of India, I've certainly studied plenty of classical art and love it. It's not that I dislike it. It's just that I felt that with um, a fifth of humanity being ignored by most of us in the West, um, it was, and the, and the majority of the people are the, I, I work with the majority of Indians, not the high art, but that which represents the people. And a large focus of my work over these many years has been on women, women's identity and uh, art as a key to understanding who the women of India are. My mentors throughout my life have mostly been women, and certainly those that introduced me to India and who engendered my work in India in the first, well, throughout, in the first years and throughout, have been women. And so I began recognizing that we in the West have misunderstood greatly who the women of India are. And I began to um, write about that. I did a, I have a, four of my books at the back, um, and I've written eight. Uh, one of them is called Daughters of India, which is a book about, um, I had interviewed over a thousand women throughout the subcontinent for many, many years, um, and felt that I just didn't want to make the same kinds of generalizations that I find made in many, many books that are inaccurate or misleading. Uh, and so instead of falling into that trap, um, I decided, I fell into another one, I decided to choose 20 women of those thousand uh, uh, that represented the north, south, east, west, very poor, wealthy, young, old, different um, cultures, subcultures, religions, etc., and chose them accordingly and let them tell their stories. So that book, Daughter, Daughters of India, was quite successful, but one of those stories is Sonabai. Now, I am a generalist. It means that what I do is I work and I compare and contrast. I'm a cultural, a cross-cultural surveyor, so I'm looking at the cultures throughout the subcontinent and trying to understand what looking at what it is and trying to understand what is not seen, what is not being written about, what is not noticed. And so I don't write monographs. You know, I don't write about one person. But I couldn't let Sonabai's story go. I couldn't sleep at night. It was such an extraordinary story. When I first went to India, I realized that what I was seeing wasn't recorded. Most of it, much of it. And I began to photograph, and um, I now have over 250,000 recorded, edited images of India, all taken before 20 years ago, um, as well as lots of digital ones since then. Uh, I don't know how many thousand, 60,000, 80,000 since then. I'm not going to show you them all tonight, but I, I, um, Sonabai. Just entering her home when I first was there, I, I had been told about it. I'd met Sonobai in Delhi, where she had been um, demonstrating her art, but I hadn't been there. It's the most remote place. I work in remote places in India. I'd never been anywhere that was as difficult to reach as Sonobai's. And to enter her home 
was like entering a cathedral. Not that it reminded me of a cathedral, but there was a quality of just overwhelming beauty, not sacred in the sense that it was images of puja, the Hindu word for worship, but it was so worshipful in its adoration of life. And so Sonabai, when I was there, and I was there over a number of times while she was still alive, would, was constantly working, um, sculpting. And the, the way in which the community treated her was with tremendous respect for what she represented for them. It was something that was very humbling to see, very, very humbling. And yet she was an extremely shy woman, uh, very, very withdrawn. I interviewed her over a period of uh, several years, and it was, uh, we became friends. And she was very much at ease with me, but she wasn't a person who was very verbal. And so I also, of course, interviewed her, interviewed her family and her other villagers to get much of the information that went into the book or went into the film. Um, I then also commissioned pieces of Sonabai, from Sonabai, uh, that became the basis of the larger exhibition, part of which is here in Ipsy, um, that uh, I, I, I gave her no, and nor the other artists, because I commissioned pieces from them as well, the artists that she had uh, influenced. I gave them no advice at all, with the exception that I said that if I am able to transport the pieces to Delhi and to the States, I will do my best to give you an exhibition. And so that was it. But as regards, they would say, well, do you want me to do? I, I, I completely would not give them any advice. And so it was wonderful to watch what came from her mind uh, in response to that suggestion that she make something. And what I had no idea, because she didn't tell me. So I said she wasn't a verbal person. Um, so she took, as you saw, I think, a straw uh, rope and nailed it onto plywood that her son purchased for her, and then took clay uh, mixed with some uh, glue so that it would be stronger. Uh, it's still very, very, very fragile. And when you come, if you come to the exhibition in Nitzlanti, you'll see that there are little cracks, etc. Things, you know, they do, it, it is ephemeral. Uh, but these figures started coming out of the plywood and, uh, you know, just watching her hands. It was so fascinating. But it was about a week of just making these pieces. And her son, uh, Durogaram, helped her. The, her husband uh, uh, had long, long since died before I ever went there. Okay. Uh, and her daughter-in-law, Rajanbai, uh, did the, the painting, the decoration with her fingers. And here were the figures once they were painted. So what they made were dancers. And um, they were male dancers. And there were female dancers. I, I, I didn't realize there were that many blondes in India when they did this. It was actually, um, of course they're not, um, made from hemp that was unwrapped. And Sonabai had invented that concept of adding uh, uh, air to sculptures. It wasn't part of the tradition anywhere. And uh, then you can see they're adding paint to the uh, hair while Rajanbai is decorating the back in the style that the walls of houses are, are painted throughout that region. 
this. Really love. So oh, here are the women dancers. So while this was happening, I, I, I said to Durogaram, so what, what is this? He said, it's a harvest dance. I said, oh, oh, when is that? I want to come. He said, well, it's next November. And this was in February or March. And I said, oh, I won't be here. I'm so sorry. And he said, oh, just do you mind? I'll, I'll come back. And he left while I was still photographing uh, the, the process of filming, I mean, the process of sculpting. And my friend David uh, Wright, who did the film filming part, was there as well. We were continued. Durogaram came back an hour later, and he said, would next Saturday do? And I said, of course. And so um, that was on, I think, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm, I'm, I'm just sculpting. And on Saturday morning, I'd actually, I mean, I'd, I didn't really know what was going to happen. And I was there busily photographing sort of this stage where they were painting when uh, it's a courtyard in the center of the house. It's the sculpted courtyard that, with all the lattice work. And I, we're sitting there where they're doing their work. And uh, we hear this noise outside, you know, the courtyard sounds come in from outside. And the, uh, that courtyard where she couldn't leave for 15 years, right? She couldn't go outside. She couldn't see her family for 15 years. Her family lived about six to eight kilometers away. Never saw them. Um, imagine that. So anyway, I'm in there. So in other words, she could have heard that sound, the sounds of the community, even though she couldn't go out and see them. And so I went out. Uh, I heard the sound of, of, of cymbals and horns and drums. We went outside, and the entire village was coming, because remember, she lived outside the village, was coming down the road, all playing, dancing. And the, the men had uh, turbans um, in their hair. And many of the turbans uh, were their wives' saris, because they no longer wear turbans, but they do for festivals. Um, the women were wearing their best saris, and um, they were doing a shuffle dance. So they shuffled together. You know, it's a sort of an ageless dance that is in so many uh, traditional cultures around the world where they have their arms around each other and they just move, shuffle as they dance. And they were singing while the men were, um, were playing their instruments a little less, more softly. And they did the parrot dance. And the parrot dance is there are two rows of women um, that are uh, down the center, and uh, I mean, on either side. And then this one woman in the center is carrying a basket on her head. And on her basket has wooden parrots that are sitting in a whole um, basket filled with paddy, which is uh, unhusked rice. And it's a harvest dance, remember? So it's a rice harvest. And so they, she is going down the center, and they're singing to her um, out uh, the words they're asking her, uh, or they're asking the parrots for guidance. And she is an oracle. And so she answers their questions. So um, some of them will ask about uh, marital disputes and get answers. And others will ask about uh, problems that they're having with their neighbors. And others will ask about whether their children are going to be OK, or whatever it might be, just different questions. And uh, the woman in the center, who is in trance, uh, speaks uh, words of the oracle. It was just wonderful, while the drums are surrounding. And it was that sense of sorority, that sense of the relationship between women, which is what I write about a lot. Um, and we in the West miss something when we criticize other cultures by perhaps being behind the veil. And we might not understand that even with what might appear to be suppression, there is, there can be other 
aspects of community and, and communication that we in the West without those restrictions may well and often do miss. So it just it behooves me not to be as critical perhaps. Uh, doesn't mean that there aren't situations in India that are horrific, there are, as there are here, and injustice is perpetrated, but don't be quick to judge another people unless you really know them. And uh, even then, maybe just wait a little bit on the judgment. And I, my experience uh, is that there's a, a remarkable sense of community that we can all learn from. And so I had photographed that. And that's when Parbati Bai, uh, a woman who is a Dalit, who is a woman who traditionally would have been called uh, untouchable, who, who lived on the other side of the village and had not been trained by Sonobai, uh, saw that um, I was filming and photographing the dance and that heard that Sonobai had made dance sculptures and she wanted to be recognized too. So she began, she had only done little clay toys. She began, Parvati Bai, to sculpt for the first time three-dimensional figures of dancers and they were fabulous. And so they're in our exhibition here in Ypsilanti as well, just a few of them. And so I featured her in my larger exhibition. I gave her a whole room of just her, well, I gave her two rooms, but a room of just her dancers. This is part of that. They were just fabulous. And then here are some of the uh, other, uh, this piece we have in the show, done by Bhagat Ram, this one. And uh, you can see the dancers at the top there. So what we have chosen for the show here is just those things that relate to the dance, uh, which of course makes sense with uh, Riyashi, um, our local extraordinary dancer. Um, and so it has it, their dance images. There are many others that I have. And this is Atmadas, the young man who, who came from a far away, 10 kilometers away by walking to uh, watch her learn and to learn from her, and then went on to study art even though he wasn't allowed to go to school. Um, it was forbidden to him. But he, he could sit outside the classroom and the teacher took pity on him even though he wasn't allowed to bring him into the class and gave him his books and the kid uh, passed the highest marks even though he didn't take the exam. He, he was amazing. Uh, he's an extraordinary artist himself and this is his home. And so we have his panels, uh, dance panels. These are actually the ones on his walls, but uh, I have his. And this was the exhibition that I did in, in San Diego. We just see a little bit of it. And uh, here I've brought these um, chiffon panels. I, I, I pushed a, uh, over a period of a few years, at a lab in New York to uh, print for me on chiffon because I wanted to make layers of imagery. And it hadn't been done before. And it took them a lot of experimenting to get the dyes it would take on chiffon, but they did. And so, as I said, we have large images and uh, these chiffon images. And you will, in the exhibition, be able to walk right through them. And it gives a whole exper experiment and then experience of it. And then for the exhibition in San Diego, we brought Darug Sonabai had died, unfortunately, a year before. But we brought Darogaram and Rajanbai. Um, and, you know, it's wonderful to watch how he treats her and how loving and caring he is. When I asked Sonabai what was the most important thing to her about her recognition, she said she didn't care at all about her awards or the fact that she traveled or any of that. But she, what she cared about was that she had been able to make enough money to ensure her granddaughters had good dowries and could choose good husbands that would care for them. And indeed, that has happened. So that's my book, uh, Sonabai. There is a film, and actually there are, I think I have 10 copies of the film in the back if anybody wants, this, uh, wants one. This program was recorded on September 6th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.